Hello, this is Angela with Parkers Permaculture. It is a gorgeous February day here in Portland, Oregon. It is cool and dry and the sun is out and there are songbirds singing outside. I can hear song sparrows and chickadees out my window. I can see them out in my front yard. It's starting to feel like spring is on the way. Now I know that it's kind of full spring. Four years ago today, we had a big snow event on this day and I was out sledding with my kids. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not too fooled about it, but I am anxious for spring. I've noticed other folks with that same kind of energy and anticipation asking in gardening groups, what trees can I order? What should I plant in my food forest as soon as the ground is workable this spring? And I have some suggestions for you. Now I titled this video, six different trees that I think are great for temperate food forests. I live in zone eight B and I'm actually going to list eight trees that I think are great, but the last two may not work in every temperate situation. So hang on with me through the first six and then I'll have two bonus ones at the end. Now, when you're looking at a food forest design, you can have a small food forest like mine. I'm on a quarter acre and the food forest is part of my front yard. So like front yard here, down the sides of my property with my house in the middle and then circling around the back here. And in the middle, I have a uh, annual veggie garden and a rain garden. So my food forest is not my entire property, but it does have dozens of trees in it. But I have to be really careful about what kinds of trees I pick because it is such a small area, because we have overhead power lines, so they don't bury the power lines here. And because I wanna be um, conscientious of the fact that my trees will overhang into my neighbor's yard if I pick large trees. So let's start with three trees that are ideal for small or large food forests. Maybe you have acres and acres. Maybe you are looking to put in, you know, a hundred acre wood. Maybe you have you know, half an acre or an acre and you can do a lot more with your property than I can do here. Don't worry, I'll have trees for you later on. But let's start with these first three that work for all of us, no matter the size of our food forest. So number one is the hazel tree. I'm a big fan. I have a squirrel planted hazel in my yard. They are native where I am, but obviously there's also Eurasian hazels as well. Why is the hazel a great choice whether you have a small or large garden? Well, it produces a nut crop, high in protein and fat. You can not only enjoy the nut meat, you can press oil. You can use the tree itself as coppice for firewood and for building things. It is great for stakes. It's great for those thin branches for weaving and making fencing in your garden, wattle in your garden. Also, you can make biochar. It's a really great wood for making biochar out of. So wonderful multi-use plant. It's also great for habitat for native birds as well. I think it's a wonderful plant that because you can coppice it and because it is more kind of shrubby and a smaller tree in general, will work in a small garden like mine, but also will thrive in the understory of a large food forest as well. Hazels are also wind pollinated and they don't need extra irrigation. They are very hardy trees and therefore a much more sustainable choice than your almond. Number two for smaller large food forest is the quince. If you've watched my channel very long, you know that I am a huge quince fan. Not only does it produce large yields of beautiful aromatic fruit, the quince Cydonia oblonga is much less susceptible to many of the pests that plague our apple trees. And therefore, I think it is a wonderful substitute in a low maintenance food forest design for the apple and for the pear as well. It doesn't get fire blight. I have found coddling moths don't really bother it. Occasionally I have a coddling moth here or there, but they're much more interested in apples. I don't have any of those other apple pests that require me to bag or spray my apples with kale and clay. One quince tree can produce twice as many pounds of fruit as an apple tree the same size. They're incredibly productive. And the fruit can be dried, it can be roasted, you can make jams with it, you can make fruit leather, you can make membrio. It's great with savory dishes with sweet dishes. I love quince roasted with potatoes and carrots and you know a spatchcock chicken over the top of it. A really versatile useful fruit and again less pest pressure. It also stays pretty small. Now I have my quince pruned so they're extra small. You can train them as a bush if you would like but they work in a food forest design, whether small or large. My last one for temperate food forests of a small size, and also again, large size, is the plum. And probably European plum would be my top pick. I don't actually grow any Asian plums at all. I really, really like 
European palms, and I find that they produce heavily year after year. Yes, there are issues. Yes, you have to deal with the fact that you might have plum curcurlio. You might have to deal with the fact that you um, could potentially have bacterial canker. There are instances where plums can be a little bit fussy, but for me, if I'm looking at pound per pound of fruit production, I can't be a plum. And I have some videos on the, the plums that I do grow here. I have to say, as time goes on, I'm more and more and more a fan of my damson plum, particularly because it suckers, it's on its own rootstock that makes it easy to divide. It makes it something you can use in a hedgerow along the edge of your food forest or along the edge of a, of a pasture land that you might have. It also has a smaller size. For me, I think that plums are such a great temperate crop because they're wonderful for fresh eating, damson excluded, because it's a little bitter. Like my Stanley plum is superb for fresh eating, for drying, for cooking. If we're looking at a food crop that has great preservation potential, I can use my plums at all kinds of savory sauces, ketchups, chutneys, and I'm able to use up the fruit really effectively year after year, and they produce heavily for me year after year. Now you need to be careful what plum varieties you pick. Some of the varieties like my early Laxton can struggle if we have late and unexpected frost. So make sure if you have a temperate food forest, you wanna pick varieties of plum that don't flower too early for your zone. So you wanna pick ones that are specific for your area, check with your local nursery. Here we go, now we're moving into large food forests. If I had the acreage, Again, this is purely academic on my part because I only have the experience of my own garden and previous gardens where I have lived and worked and grown food. I dream of the potential of having a two or three or five acre food forest, but it's not a reality for me. So this is going based on what I know of growing these trees personally and interacting with them at different, different periods of my life and in friends and colleagues' gardens as well. So when you're looking at a large scale food forest, I think walnut is a great choice. We have loads of squirrel planted walnuts here in Oregon. I'm pointing to my next door neighbor, Ben. Um, because they are invasive and squirrel planted, I wouldn't intentionally put one in. It's also too large for my space. Downside of a walnut is that it does secrete juglone, and so therefore it has some um, germination inhibition properties to it. But in a food forest design, it works really well. Why walnut and why not a another nut? Sure, you could use different nuts. Pecan trees get huge, butternut trees get huge, but having a nut crop is so important because again, that is a source of oil, it's a source of protein and fat. And it's really important if we're looking at sustainable design, fruit can't really feed us. Fruit is sort of a self-limiting food for humans. We're not meant to be frugivores, but we do need those rich fats and proteins that we get from nut crops. Another benefit of nut crops like the walnut is that if you don't shell them and you store them with good air circulation in a cool environment, they can last years. In fact, Edible Acres had a video years ago, I might have to link to it down below if I can find it actually, where he talked about how he stores nuts for long periods of time. Walnuts are versatile, they are delicious, they have a lot of nut meat to the size of the tree and how much space the tree takes up in your food forest design. Second is black locust. I have grown a purple robe locust in my garden. I took it out this winter. I have a little video where I talk about that. The locust tree is a nitrogen fixing, beautiful tree. It is considered invasive in some areas, but even where it's considered invasive, I've noticed that permaculture food foresters who have enough property include it because it is such a useful tree fantastically useful. The blossoms are gorgeous. They're great bee food. They're also edible for people. The rest of the tree, including the beans, is not edible for people. The nitrogen fixing um, quality of this pioneer species makes it great when you are starting a food forest to get your fertility cycling, to get that nitrogen fixed, to have chop and drop for your garden. You can't beat a black locust. It's very quick growing. The wood is very hard and very rot resistant. In many places, it is used for fencing material and building material because it is so daggone rot resistant. Wonderful, versatile building material for your fences and, and exterior structures. It also has a high BTU and is great for firewood. Now, because it's so hard, folks often recommend that you split it when it's really green. I have not personally split any for firewood. I have used prunings off of my purple robe locust and I do agree it burns very hot and nice. So you've got the uh, fact that it is a food source for our native pollinators, especially bumblebees really love it. You can eat the flowers. You have a nitrogen fixing uh, benefit to the other plants in your system. 
You have the wood that is incredibly useful for building, fencing, etc., and for firewood. That makes it a great tree. It gets very large and it also tends to put out suckers. So please don't use it in a small food forest design. The last one that I have for large scale food forests, and I'm gonna have a little like caveat here because I grow it in my yard, is the mulberry. I have to prune mine heavily. I pollard mine every year. If you wanna put in a mulberry like my Illinois Everbearing that will get 60 feet and you have a small garden like mine, a small food forest design, please know you are committing yourself to heavy pruning a couple times a year to keep it contained. But if you have a large food forest, you have tons of space to put in mulberries and they yield prolifically. I have a video on how my mulberry produces, my freezer is just stocked full of mulberries. When other crops failed in a very dry, uh, un unusually hot year, where my other berries had a hard time, my mulberries just kept cranking out the fruit for weeks and weeks and weeks and I was picking every day. So mulberry is a wonderful sustainable crop. You can use the wood for all kinds of things. It's great chop and drop. The leaves are edible to all kinds of livestock. Everybody says they make great poultry feed. My chickens are not interested in them at all, but you can dry the leaves and grind them up and add them to your, your poultry feed if you want, but they don't really like the fresh leaves in my experience. It's just a really nice versatile crop. I grow my mulberry down in my poultry run because the ducks and chickens will clean up any fruit that uh, I miss that falls off the tree. They really like the fruit. So now for two bonus trees that I think work in small or large, um, sorry my chair's squeaky, small or large food forest design. The reason these are tagged on at the end is because they are not gonna be trees that you can grow in a cooler temperate climate, or they may need special care in order to do well in a cooler temperate permaculture food forest design. And perhaps you want your food forest design to be much more um, independent of you and to be able to take care of itself and you don't wanna do that extra work. But if you live in a mild zone like me, 8B, you could grow figs and Asian persimmons. If you live somewhere colder, you would have to dig up your figs or grow them in pots. But where I am, I can grow them in the ground and they produce really well every year. Sometimes if we have an extremely cold winter, I have a little bit of damage, but figs are a high yield crop and they are an expensive crop to buy fresh. And when you buy them in the grocery store, they're picked prematurely and they never really develop that sugar like a fig that you pick fresh out of your food forest. One of the reasons that figs and Asian persimmons are two trees that I recommend so highly is that they are great storage potential. They dry incredibly well. We're looking at ways of preserving food that do not require uh, freezing. A lot of my berries have to be frozen. Don't require a lot of sugar like canning does. You can dry persimmons and you can dry figs very easily and that food will keep for a long time. And they're a high yield, high sugar crop that is great for cooking with other dishes. And they're also both really lovely trees. I don't wanna undercount the value of having aesthetics in your permaculture food forest design. So those are my eight trees, three for small or large food forests, three for only large food forests, and the two bonuses if you live in a little bit warmer end of the temperate zone. I hope that was helpful for you. If you have favorite trees for your permaculture food forest, I would love to hear about it in the comments. Please don't forget to click like and subscribe. That's a small thing you can do that makes a big difference for me. I'll be back really soon. Thanks.